systems. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. 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 Sorry about that. No, 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 no so problem. We, um, I've kicked everybody out. Sorry about that <laughs> of the of the Zoom room, but we are going to start the workshop. I was talking, so I, by the time I I heard you, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. We managed. We managed. Uh, it's like uh, everybody working in concert, and at the end, it works. <laughs> so we are going to now um, follow Marie Andersson, who is from Berman Labora, the company that uh, represents uh, Nikon here in Sweden. Uh, because, as you may know, our uh, our facility is the Nikon Center of Excellence, and uh, so we have a very close contact with Berman Labora. Uh, and so we're going to have the only live, apart from the student imaging workshop, the only live thing, <laughs> let's say, by the microscope and everything that we have. Uh, so Marie is going to, uh, to show us uh, our dear Twitty and what's going on there. So, Marie, please, thank you very much. Yes, I'm going to share the screen. Share. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. So, um, I, okay, as Sylvie said, I'm Marie and I'm from Barma Labora. Sorry, could, could, you, could you minimize, you know, the, the, the list of uh, people on the side there? If you just uh, click on the little square or something like this, yeah, then just yeah. so that it doesn't take uh, part of the screen. Yeah, okay. great, thank you. So I'm going to do most of this on the live screen at the system with the cameras that we have here, but just to make sure that you know what a camera sensor is about. I have just a few slides to show you the different sensor architectures that you may uh, approach or find in the future. And the fundamentals of a camera sensor is very, very easy. You can see it as small buckets that have a photoreactive surface. They are collecting photons and converting them to photoelectrons. And all camera sensors need to collect these and then they need to be transferred out pixel row or pixel by pixel to something called a readout node, a readout register. And when it comes to the readout register, after a while, it will be converted, it will be amplified into a readable voltage, converted into a digital gray level using the analog to digital converter. And then it will be sent to the computer via the imaging uh, software. And uh, there are mainly three different kinds of camera sensors. The first one that is maybe the oldest one and the most, uh, back in the days, it was the most uh, common one is the CCD sensor, charge couple device sensor. And uh, basically it collects the photon and it transfers them row by row or uh, frame by frame to the readout register down here. And then it will go to the output node and then will be converted to a readable signal for the PC. Uh, one uh, main issue with uh, the CCDs is that they are not really fast. You can't really image very fast with them. And they are also not as sensitive. So it's a very challenging maybe to perform low light imaging or to capture very fast dynamic moving events with it. And, uh, and that is because the whole sensor needs to be cleared from all these electrons to the readout register before it can start to, to collect more photons in the exposure. Um, one way to overcome this is to have an EMCCD sensor. An EMCCD stands for electron magnifying CCD sensor. Um, it's still a frame transfer of all the electrons, but it comes to the readout register and then it also goes through something called the EM gain register. So in this EM gain register, the photoelectrons that are collected are magnified or multiplied. So basically, if you have uh, five electrons in the beginning that is detected by the sensor and you set this EM gain to 200, the final signal that will go out to this 
output mode will be approximately 1000. So you are magnifying the signal. And this is really good because here you can detect really, really low uh, signals and you can amplify the signal without amplifying the electronics of the camera sensor because the camera is full of electronics. And if you are starting to amplify electrons, you can also amplify the electrons that are produced by the electronic circuit in the camera. So uh, EMCCD sensors are really, really good if you're looking for single photons. This is the camera that you need to go. But there are some limitations here also. They have quite large pixels, so you can't really get high resolution with them. They build up charge over time, so the effect of this EM gain can be reduced quite quickly after a couple of years, and also it's very costly. Uh, the camera sensor that is most common nowadays, and this is the sensor that you have in all your cell phone uh, cameras, and this is the CMOS sensor because the CMOS sensor is, has all these readout uh, uh, register, everything goes on underneath the photoreactive surface. So you don't really have a full readout register. So the electronics here are really miniaturized and it occurs on every single piece, pixel. And this means that the readout will be really, really fast because this ADC conversion is also taking care on in even all single pixels. And there are sensors where you can, as soon as you're reading out one pixel, you can start expose it for next, uh, collecting more photons. So you can reach much, much higher speeds with the CMOS sensors. You can also have a larger camera sen uh, sensor and it's also less expensive. And I guess that is one of the reasons why they are present in most of your cameras. But there are two different uh, sensors for CMOS. You have a front illuminated, oh, sorry, front illuminated, and you can also have a back illuminated. And the difference between them is basically the quantum efficiency, because in the front illuminated, the the uh, photons are coming through these micro lenses and then it's going through all these uh, metal wiring that is the electronics and then it reaches the substrate that collect the uh, photons and convert them to the electrons. In the back illuminated, uh, the photons are hitting the photoreactive surface immediately and then it goes down to the area where it's converted or read out. All these uh, images are coming from the web page from photometrics.com so that you can check it out. So that's it. Now let's go to, um, see where is the escape button there? Let's go to our software elements instead. So on this system, Tweety, we do have two front uh, back illuminated CMOS sensors from Photometrics. One is called Kinetics and it has pixels that are 6.5 micrometers. So they are quite medium sized. The other one is called Prime 95B and it's still a back illuminated uh, CMOS sensor and it has 11 micrometer pixels. So those pixels are bigger than the one with the kinetics. And uh, there are a few things that you need to consider when you are choosing a camera for your application. And I will go through a few of them here and try to show it also here on online. And the first objective that is important is sensitivity. That is how dim can your sample be and you can still image it or detect the photons of it. So, both these cameras are have a quantum efficiency of 95%. And I'm pretty sure that Sylvie has explained the quantum efficiency. It's basically that one photon should give one electron, and then you have a quantum efficiency of 
100%. So it's the ratio of the number of collected electrons and the number of incident photons that give you electrons that you can convert. And these cameras has a quantum efficiency of 95%. But there is one other thing that needs to be considered when then it comes to sensitivity, and that is the pixel size of the camera sensor. One camera has 6.5 pixels, micrometer pixels, and the other one has 11. And what you're looking at here right now, if I go live, is the kinetics camera with the 6.5 micrometer pixels. And with this objective, you can see that we have, uh, let's see if I can zoom in. There, 0 0.33 micrometer per pixel with the kinetics camera. So I will just capture an image here. I will notice what the exposure time I have. It's 30 milliseconds and I have 7.57 in uh, light intensity. And I will switch to the 95B camera. Choose the same color, 30 milliseconds in the camera exposure time. And what did I say, nine? <laughs> I don't remember, it's terrible. Sylvie, do you remember? What intensity I had? Yes. What? Sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> Do you remember what intensity I had on the? Uh, Seven point uh, forty-seven, I think. Yeah. What? Seven point uh, forty-seven, I think. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I will do here now is just okay. First, go a little bit live to see that it's okay, and I will capture that image. And from this now, if we compare these two images, I'm gonna put them up one by one, and I'm also going to close a few of the images so that we can compare them. And I will also synchronize them together. And what we will look at here is here, we have something called statistics of the intensities in the images. And if I'm starting to zoom in, I think you already here can see that to the left, we have the kinetics camera with smaller pixels. And to the right, we have the Prime 95B with the larger pixels. And already here, you can see that we have much brighter cells here than compared to the other one. And uh, looking at the, here in this, let's see if I can get the pointer to work there. You see that we have a mean intensity in each build. This is the mean intensity in the kinetics with small pixels. And if I click here, you will see that the mean intensity is higher in the camera with larger pixels, even though they have the same quantum efficiency. That is how many electrons you can get out from 100 electrons. You have nine, no, from 100 photons, you will have 95 electrons. But there is, of course, one little disadvantage by having larger pixels, and that is resolution. So I'm going to try to find, uh, there we have a cell. So if I'm continuing to zooming in on the cells, I think you will quite quickly start to see that the image from the camera with larger pixels will much faster break up into little squares. So with the smaller pixels, you will have a higher resolution, but you will have a brighter signal. There is one way to get uh, a brighter signal, even though you have a dim sample, or if you have uh, small pixels, and that is to do binning of the camera. So we will go back to the kinetics now with the smaller pixels. We'll go to green. And we are back here now in the live image of kinetics with the small pixels. So uh, let's say that I will reduce the exposure time so that I get a kind of 
dim signal here, and I will capture this. In this case, I do not have any binning. And these camera sensors, where you can combine uh, pixels, so instead of using just one photon or one pix uh, photon collecting element as one pixel in the image, you can combine two by two. So that is four pixels. So I will just capture with binning 2.2. And already here, you start to see what's happening. And if I even increase this and go to binning four times four, so this is basically 16 pixels that will be displayed as one in the image. And here we are super, super bright now. And let us compare those and just throw away these that are, sorry, uh, that one. One. So here we do have three kinetics images. I'm gonna synchronize them. And we are also going to synchronize them so they they will do the same lookup table so that we are not uh, showing anything. And here we can start to see now that without any binning, with lower exposure time, we have a quite dim signal. If we are binning it to time two on the middle image, you see that we have a brighter signal. And also, if we go now to four times four combining, we have 16 pixel displays as one. We will have a super bright image where we start to see even saturation. And if I just make this, see if I can make this a little bit less. Oh, it's so saturated now. But what you also see here that binning also will uh, uh, decrease the resolution of your cell. We start to see these little squares of the resolution quite quickly. But if you're not interested in resolution, you just want to increase the signal of your sample, then binning is a really good way to go to see the dim samples. I'm gonna close this, clean up a little bit. There is also another way that you, when you think about how you're imaging, and that is if you have a sample that contains both very, very bright features and also dim features. For example, I'm going to decrease the uh, exposure time here, just a minute. I'm gonna decrease the, as you can see here on the image, we do have some features here in the middle where we are in saturation. And most imaging softwares also have this feature of pixel saturation indicator. This pixel saturation indicator shows you what pixels that have uh, collected more photons than it can hold. So it starts to spill over to neighboring pixels. It's called blooming. And also, I think if you can see this, if you're looking here at the lookup table, you can see here that the dynamic range of this camera is 4,000, or in this mode is 4,095. That means that we have zero to 4,095 different uh, gray levels. That is what you can do in the 12-bit readout, 12-bit mode. This is the dynamic range. And you can see that a lot of pixels are beyond this 4,095 value. So meaning that we can't really see any details where you get this blooming effect. That is called saturation. So if I capture this now in 12-bit where you have a dynamic range to 4,095, Oh, sorry, I was in binning, but okay, let's continue with that. Uh, with this camera, we can go up to 16 bit. This is increasing the dynamic range of this camera. And what you see here is that the image is dimmer, but we get rid of the 
saturation because in 16 bit mode, the dynamic range is 65,535 different gray levels that this wealth can hold. This means that even if you have really, really bright dim and really dim signals, you can display them all. So meaning that you will have a much better dynamic range within your sample. But we can also go and, uh, yeah, of course you can bin even more. This particular camera, the kinetics have also a 8-bit mode. And in 8-bit, if we are looking for the lookup table again, 8-bit mode means that you just have 255 different grayscales from black at zero to brightest capacity in 255. And what you can see here is that you start to see something else when you're pushing the, uh, the lookup table. If you're looking here, you see that you have noise in the image because now we are reading out the sensor really, really, really fast. We are running in fast frame speeds, but we will also see noise in the image. So I will capture this one, a noisy image that does not look really, really good, but we could image quickly because we have a fast readout speed and we have a really narrow dynamic range. So what can you do to increase the signal to noise ratio in this image. Let's look at the ROI statistics again, where you can see that the signal to background, I'm gonna show you here, see if I can, see. there is the magnifier. Oh. <laughs> you see that the signal to background here, signal to noise ratio is 6.42 to one. That is not much. So, so instead of now just taking one image, I will start to average this image. That is, That means that instead of just capturing one image, I will run the same acquisition several times. And as noise coming from the camera sensor is random, it will be removed and the signal where you have signal in every frame, it will be captured. And you can choose to do the uh, averaging different many times. I'm gonna to choose to go eight times here now and I will capture now with averaging eight times to see if I can improve the image or the signal to noise ratio. Yeah, not that much. Let's see how they look together. So we tend to actually acquire three images like a time-lapse without delay. This I'm going to do that. Yeah, it's fun to, to actually see, visualize the noise. Yeah. It works quite well. So, okay. So, signal to background four to one. The other image is 6.1. Oh, I hadn't expected that. But another thing that you also can do is to use denoising. There are different algorithms that you can use. And now I can't reach the menu up here because this is in its way. The recording, can I get rid of that? Uh, don't say leave meeting, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because I, I need to get up here to the menu. <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly how this works, but I think in, in, if you click on the more, the three little dots there. Yeah. You should be able to say hide, uh, hide the the floating. That floating one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No. Uh, no. So, right. Okay. Click on okay there. I think. Oh. Yeah. Okay. No. I'm still I'm still with you. Okay. So what I'm going to use here is uh, AI that is trained to remove noise in the image. 
So just give me a second. And there are several uh, denoising uh, algorithms that can be used. So this can be worth doing if you need this fast frame rate readout speed, then it can be worth to do some denoising afterwards. And now I'm just going to synchronize them all and use the same lookup table on all of them. And I think you clearly see that in the image here to the right, we Could have- Could you increase a little bit the brightness? Okay, goodness. yeah. Okay, now, thank you. You can see that here we can see we have removed the noise by doing the noising, even though we were running in the fastest readout mode. And as Sylvie told you, it can be quite important if you would like to capture dynamic events. So to do that, I will actually go to the 95B. And we're going for steel green. So I have, I want to just, uh, uh, there's a, in, a question by Yufei in, uh, in the chat. This function only exists in camera, right? Uh, Yufei, which, uh, which function were you talking about? Uh, for the, uh, for the, the denoising. So, so sorry, just, so what did you say, Yufei? The bin. The binning. Yes, no. binning only is, is only for cameras, it's but you only... can do the same thing on a single point confocal by yes. setting big pixels. Yes. Because in a in a point scanning confocal, you have completely full control over the over the pixel size. Okay, thank you. So, okay, we are live again now, and we are running in twelve bits. So, what I'm going to do is just to make a quick uh, a quick time lay. Let's say ten seconds, no delay, and we will first run now. What we're going to run now is going to one frame because that is the fastest the camera can run. So that will give us a frame rate of approximately, uh, let me see, it's 60 frames a second when we are running in the lower dynamic range. So let's start. I'm going to run 10 seconds. Here we go. That is that we got approximately 339 frames. And now I will go to the 16 bit that has a higher dynamic range and thereby it also has a slower readout. And looking at the frame rate will give you 30 frames a second instead. So that should be approximately half of the images that you will capture. I'm going to So with the higher dynamic range with this lower readout you will have been able to capture 300 frames and with the one with the the lower dynamic, the faster readout, you will have 339 frames. But as Sylvie pointed out, the faster readout you have on your camera, the more noise will uh, be added to the image. So it's a trade off depending on what your uh, question, scientific question is for your imaging. Right. Uh, another thing that is quite important to think about is uh, the field of view. So let's go back to kinetics and close these images.
And let's go to green as we did last time. And as you can see here, we still do have some uh, saturation here. CMOS sensors, as I told you, can be very, very large, meaning that we can get a larger field of view than compared with a, a CCD sensor or a IM CCD sensor. And I'm going to display that here now. So at the moment, these cameras, we are running in 25 millimeter field of view. So I will capture that. I will decrease the ROI size to 22 millimeter capture. And finally, let's go for approximately 18 millimeter and capture. And why is this important, you think? Well, let's synchronize these images and start to zoom out. So as you can see here in the image where you have 25 millimeter field of view, you can capture a lot more cells. So for example, if we are doing a large image stitching, it will go faster to stitch the image, get the overview faster with a larger field of view. And also what is quite important, I'm gonna show you now, that is if you're doing image analysis, let's go and get a DAPI image. I'm gonna close all again, clean up a little bit. So, A little bit of focus. So this is now the nuclei and I'm running now in the smallest 18 millimeter field of view. I will capture that. I'm switching now to 22 millimeter capture. And we will go for 25 millimeter and capture. So we have three different images with three different field of view. And I have prepared here just a short uh, cell count that I can do. So let's start with the one with a uh, uh, small field of view. We can synchronize them also, so we can zoom out on them. And I'm just run the cell count here, which gave us 400 and, oh, this was the 25 millimeter where we have 415 number of cells counted. If I do the same on the 22 millimeter field of view, I have 334. And with the smallest field of view, I will have only 260. So from 260 to 450. So almost double the number of cells or whatever you are counting, analyzing can be captured when you have a large field of view. And a large field of view is really what CMOS cameras are uh, famous for, that they can have these large sensors. Do you have any questions this far? Okay. Mm -hmm. I think the questions may come later. They may come later. <laughs> How long time do I have? <laughs> uh, you have until 45. So 45, another six okay. minutes, so, but it's fine. You can yeah, stop yeah, yeah. But, okay. can, uh, but There is basically, it's basically one more thing that I think is important to mention. And Actually, that is yeah, Marie, the resolution. You Faye had a question. So I have a question not related to the but the, the picture. Why why there is a blue circle? At what? The background? Where, uh, why so is that... there a blue circle? Where? Sorry. In the picture. A blue yeah. circle. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, because it can be dust or it can be on my old sample in the glass. The glass has cracks and uh, these kind of. Uh, 
things are very visible when you're doing the DAPI channel. But it doesn't uh, uh, affect the analysis. Sorry? I mean, uh, if, uh, it doesn't uh, um, have any effect on, on the analyzing. No, because uh, I have done this thresholding, uh, excluding thresholding image analysis is always based on that you are thresholding a range of pixel intensities and the pixel intensity in that feature. I see what you mean. It's a blue dot here, probably some rubbish. That intensity is lower than mm -hmm. what I'm looking for. So if I'm increasing the intensity, you see that the cells are quite bright. Mm -hmm. And this is too dim to be uh, collected as a cell. Okay, thank you. Okay, so resolution. Uh, camera sensors has a defined pixel size. So we have 6.5 pixels on the kinetics camera, and we have 11 micrometer pixels on the uh, 95 camera and uh, for resolution and I'm sure that Sylvie has gone through this the Nyquist sampling that uh, the resolution of a camera is 0 0.61 times the wavelength and you need to divide it with the numerical aperture of the objective and also the magnification but the most important thing is that you always need to have it sampled 2.3 times with a camera. And uh, then you need to start to calculate because it's dependent on the wavelengths. And so I just also... want to, to flag uh, quickly that, as I said before, there are many different uh, ways to calculate things. And yeah. in the course, just for simplicity, we have mm -hmm. chosen two for everything. But okay. as you can see, uh, Marie, and it's very often the case uh, for cameras that we count 2.3. Yes. So that means we do have a camera with a pixel size that is 11 micrometer, and we do have one with 6.5 micrometers. So what objective should we choose here to get that 2 or 2.3 over sampling? That's the question. And I have, since I'm not having time to capture images with oil objectives. I have prepared a image with an oil objective. That is an objective that has a higher numerical uh, objective, high numerical aperture at 1.4. I have also prepared one both for kinetics and one for 95B here. So, and I hope that you can visualize this on the screen. Not sure, maybe we need to synchronize them and increase the lookup table a little bit. So this is now with the 60X objective that has 1.4 as numerical aperture. And when I'm calculating this, with the 60x 1.4 objective, then it should be optimal to use uh, 6.3 micrometer pixels, which we have on the left image. If I'm calculating it for uh, uh, 95b, we will see that, okay, the pixels that we get with this magnification is too small because we would like to have a pixel size that is uh, approximately over 10 micrometer. So the correct way to go with the kinetics camera is to use uh, the 60X oil objective due to the numerical aperture. But what happens if I go for 20X? So let's go live and capture an uh, image on uh, 20X. The formula here says that, okay, we should have 6.3 micrometer pixels, but calculating it with uh, the 20X, 
means that you will only have 3.5 micrometer pixels. So meaning that using a 20x objective is uh, not correct because you will not do that 2.3 uh, sampling that you're needing to see the fine structures. And I know that it's difficult for you to see, but I think that you can see that in the two images to the left, maybe especially the one taken with 6.5 micrometer pixels, you can see that we have much finer, we have a higher resolution that we can see finer structures on these cytoskeleton compared with Could you capture... change the gamma a little bit if you move the little ball there in the middle so yeah, we can yeah. see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, very great. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's it good. helps a lot. Yeah, thanks. So you can see that we can see finer structures by using the correct uh, objective to the camera. Yeah, it's very difficult to... Mm -hmm. But I yeah, hope but that I you can see that structure, yeah. structures. One way of doing it, if you, if you have now uh, not an objective that is uh, correct for the camera sensor that you have, you can always use uh, intermediate magnifier. So for example, if I put in here now the 1.5 lens on the microscope, which we can do. And let's go live. So this is the one that I, I was calling extra magnification. Extra so magnification. <laughs> yeah, so this is extra magnification now, 1.5, and capture that one. And that means that with 20x objective, that in this case gave us 3.9 micrometer pixels that were too small for using with the camera, with the kinetics camera. Now I have 5.9 micrometer pixel size instead. So let's check that also and synchronize. And uh, now you can see that compare with the, the lower row, left and right, you see that we can resolve finer structures when we are adding that extra uh, magnification because we are adjusting the pixel size so that it matches the camera. So if resolution, highest possible resolution is the main thing for you when you're doing your imaging, you need to always consider that when you're working with a camera. What objective to use? First, check what camera sensor do I have? Do the calculation and see if any of the objectives works well to get the highest resolution. But sometimes it really doesn't matter because maybe you're just interested to see a signal. And then you can be fine with imaging also with big pixels to get a strong signal because big pixels can have a collect more, more photons. Right, I think that was right. mostly what I was about to That talk was really about. spot on, Marie, because we really had uh, lots of discussions today about, okay, when do we on the sample? When is it okay? When do we have to uh, image again, <laughs> according mm -hmm. to Nyquist and everything? So that was very good. When do we create artifacts because we on yeah. the sample, blah, blah, blah. So it's, uh, it's really, it comes just at the right time. Cool. So I would like to know if there are uh, some questions about this. I would have a question. Yes. Um, so here you added uh, 1.5 uh, extra magnification and you did that on a microscope, but can you do that on in the software as well? Or how can... Um, right. Uh, this is a camera. So zooming in means that you are uh, doing a digital zoom. Mm -hmm. So, no, you, okay. the pixel size is fixed on the camera. On a point scanning confocal, you have control over the pinhole size. So there you can control the pixel size in your image by zooming in or adding the Nyquist medical button so that it calculates it uh, 
the oh you also call uh, it magical button i also call I it i call it a magic yeah, it's the night night fish magical button, button. <laughs> i wish so much <laughs> because you don't need camera. to do you don't need to do the calculations you just click the magical button and then it will make the pixels the adjust the pixels to the size that you need. But in a camera, this is a fixed camera sensor. The architecture is there. You can't do anything to change it. You can do binning, meaning that you are combining two by two or four by four pixels to get a bigger pixel that you can do, but you can't really do anything to affect this. Except, except add the extra magnification. This if, is yes, much. the extra yeah, that... magnification is needed in that case. Yeah, and that I can see in on the microscope itself on the yeah, in the, yes, the front. exactly. Yeah, so you mm -hmm. you need to ask because on the 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 Nikon system it's very easy to see because it's right at the front of the microscope. But uh, on other microscopes, uh, it can be a little bit hidden. So mm -hmm. just ask the person in charge, and it's quite common that the person in charge doesn't know. Or it can be also that uh, simply it's an option. Uh, when you buy the microscope and this was not uh, taken and it it's it's really fantastic so it's also something that doesn't have to cost much money no. and it can be possible for the person for, for you to add this magnification yes. and like uh, buy the hardware so if you if you're not sure if you have it or not contact the company in charge of your microscope and ask them does my microscope have one and if not how much does it cost and you mm -hmm. may as well you know be able to now that you know uh, how useful it is on a camera based system to have this extra magnification you mm -hmm. may be able to convince uh, your boss to buy one <laughs> or yeah. the facility and uh, for those who are working in this system with this software you will also see here that it the software knows when you're adding it, zoom 1.5, and when I'm moving it out, it will say now zoom 1. So you do not need to bother about uh, calibrations or so on. If you're doing measurements or stitching, the calibration will be changed, so measurements will be correct. Are there any more questions? Okay, well, if not, Marie, thank you okay. very much. Thank this you. This was uh, very good and very informative. So um, okay. thanks a lot. So good luck with the rest of the course. Thank you, thank you. Bye. Uh, okay, everyone, we're going to continue uh, with the same uh, uh, workshop uh, Zoom. And let me see what time it is. We will have a break in a few minutes. Um, I think that before we, what we can do actually, because now, uh, what we can do is take the break now and, uh, and we will be back in 15 minutes, which should be, let's say at 10 past. Okay. So we take the break now, we come back at uh, 10 past three, and then we will continue with our quizzes. If you have any questions, I'm here, so you can ask. Otherwise, see you at 10 past three. Sylvie, I was wondering, yeah. uh, it's maybe more a practical question regarding the course itself. Um, my colleague, they had the same course last year and they were asking me about the exam and I wasn't sure because in the course catalog it says we have one, but then I didn't I have see removed the exam. Thing. Sorry? I have removed the exam. Okay, because um... last year, some students cheated and okay. I can't blame them. It's my fault because I was always reusing the same questions. <laughs> so, you know, now that we've been running a course for a number of years, there are a number of people <laughs> who have uh, had this course. So uh, basically they got the answers before. It was very, very obvious. And uh, so and then it got me thinking. Actually, it was very good because I got me thinking we don't need this exam. Okay. Uh, yeah. Because we have the portfolio and the portfolio yeah. is so much more important. So oh, off, no more exam. Yeah, I just wanted to know because I wasn't sure when it would have been. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I don't know. No, thanks. No problem.